you. Before you continue, I note we, you have another member from your team, Mr. Tigger. Yes, Mr. President, and again, as I indicated earlier, uh, Ms. Pack is now with us. She will be addressing the court in regard to Srebrenica um, relatively soon. Thank you. Please continue, Ms. Gustafsson. Thank you, Your Honors. I'd like to turn now to the sniping incidents that took place in the Marin Dvor area. These are F-8, F-11, F-12, F-14, F-15, and F-16. And all these attacks took place along the main thoroughfare, Zmaya od Bosna, at or near the S-curve in the tram tracks, and along the stretch of road known at the time as Sniper Alley. And as we set out in our brief at paragraphs 13 to 22, the evidence for these incidents overwhelmingly demonstrates deliberate SRK attacks on civilians. SRK sniping from Gerbavica into Zmaya od Bosna was common knowledge at the time. And on-site forensic investigations confirmed this. The defense attempts to undermine this evidence rest, again, on Popovich's efforts to second-guess the contemporaneous findings through speculative and unsupported claims and unscientific methodologies. I'd like to focus on F-11, which relates to one of the trial chamber's questions. And the F-11 attack was the second of three similar machine gun attacks that took place in the space of just a few minutes in the same area on the 8th of October, 1994. Another tram was hit by machine gun fire immediately before the F-11 attack, and a few minutes after the attack, a machine gun opened fire on a group of pedestrians in the same area. And now the chamber has asked the prosecution about a discrepancy between adjudicated fact 2932, which states that the shots came from the direction of the Matalka building, and P2421 a UN report indicating that the shots originated from a group of houses near the Jewish cemetery. And I'd like to address the chamber's more theoretical question first, which is what should the chamber do when the prosecution's evidence contradicts an adjudicated fact? And in that respect, uh, the jurisprudence is clear that judicially noticed facts are presumptions and it's ultimately up to the trial chamber to assess their relevance and weight in light of the evidence as a whole, and I refer to the Caramera Appeals Chamber decision of 16 June 2006, paragraph 42, the Popovich Trial Chamber decision of the 26th of September 2006, at paragraph 21, and the Kryzhnik Trial Chamber decision of 24 March 2005, at paragraph 17. In this instance, however, the prosecution's position, as we set out in Appendix C, paragraph 18 of our brief, is that the tram in F-11 was targeted from SRK-held positions to the south of the Milyachka River, and this is consistent with all the credible evidence in this case, including adjudicated fact 2932 and the UN report P2421. And I'd like to refer in this respect to this visual aid, which is P6018. This is a photo taken from the south looking north at the incident site. And here we have the same photo on which we have indicated some locations uh, to assist the trial chamber. Now this incident took place on Zmaya Ob Bosna at either the intersection with Franja Rachkog Street, which is spot two in this visual aid, or the intersection with Jure Danici Street, which is spot one. Now the spot numbers are for convenience and they coincide with the Umprofor maps in the Umprofor report of this very incident and indicate some of the positions of UN observers at the time of the attack. And that's P2421 and the map is at pages four to five of the French version. The evidence of KDZ090, 
for example, P481, pages 6 to 9, P436, and P437. And the local investigator's report, P1907, page 2, as well as adjudicated fact 2924 and 2932, identify the location of the F-11 attack as spot 2 with the Metalka building, which is also indicated here, as the source of fire. And this conclusion was endorsed by van der Weyden. That's P1629, pages 89 to 91. P2421, the contemporaneous Umpafor report, as well as the identification of the location to Barry Hogan, as indicated in P1028, for the purpose of plotting the location of the attack on a map, which is P2191, identify the location of the attack as spot one. So there is some uncertainty as to the precise location of the attack in this instance. An uncertainty that is understandable in light of the fact that the tram was moving from east to west at the time of the attack. And I refer to van der Weyden's evidence in this respect at 7175 to 7176. The Umprefor conclusion that spot one was the location of the attack is supported by the observations of Umprefor personnel at the scene. That's P2421, pages two and six and its ballistics analysis. In particular, Umprefor analyzed fresh furrows located in the ground at spot one, and that's reflected in P2421, pages three and seven. And these furrows all pointed directly at house 14 near the Jewish cemetery. That's P2421, pages three to eight. And we have indicated the rough location of that house on this visual aid as well. The angle of entry of the bullets into the tram, also analyzed by Umprefor, when transposed to spot one, also pointed to this origin of fire, P2421, page three. Van der Weyden did not exclude this scenario, namely that the tram was attacked at spot one, in which case fire would have come from SRK positions near uh, to the west of the Jewish cemetery. But he decided in favor of spot two based on the time of exposure to fire of the tram and the possible delay of witnesses realizing they were under fire. And of course the tram in this case was moving from left to right. As, as you can see uh, uh, in relation to this visual aid. So while there is some uncertainty in the evidence as to the precise location of the origin of fire, which corresponds to uncertainty as to the precise location of the attack, the trial chamber need not make a specific finding on this issue. And this is because, regardless of whether the attack took place at spot one or spot two, the fire undoubtedly originated from SRK positions to the south of the Milyachka. And this is because, first, both positions were exposed to notorious SRK sniping positions. From spot two, the Metalka building, and from spot one, houses near the Jewish cemetery. And the alternative contention, that the fire came instead from this small strip of ABIH held territory between the tram tracks and the river, is not a reasonable alternative. This would require the gunner to have sprayed this tram with a machine gun from a position immediately across the street from the tram. In plain sight of the passengers, as well as multiple UN personnel who were present and monitoring sniping activity at the time. This highly implausible and illogical notion is not supported by any credible evidence. And it was explicitly rejected by van der Weyden. He explained that if the tram had been fired at from ABIH territory to the south, the shooter would be just 25 meters away. A quote, completely illogical, end quote, scenario, given the well-known presence of the international press at the Holiday Inn, which of course is the yellow building depicted here. That's page 7175. Nevertheless, this is exactly the theory posited by defense expert Popperich, who claimed 
that the fire in all three attacks on this day came from the Executive Council building, shown here. And that's a transcript page 39252. Now, Popovich's theory is fatally flawed for a number of reasons. First, according to Popovich, two trams and then a group of pedestrians were successively fired on by a machine gun repeatedly from a position immediately across the street from the trams in plain sight of everyone around without anyone noticing. This repeated machine gun fire would also have to have been missed by multiple UN anti-sniping personnel who were positioned right in front of the Executive Council building, among other nearby locations, and monitoring sniping activity in the area. That's P2421. Further increasing the practically certain risk of detection, the shooter would have to have been at ground level or a very low floor of the building due to the very low, in fact, nine degree from horizontal trajectory angle of the bullet into the tram. And this was Umperfor's determination based on its physical examination of the bullet hole entries in the tram. That's P2421, page four. Umperfor's trajectory determination directly contradicts Popperich's theory that the angle of descent of the bullets in this case was very high, between 45 and 60 degrees. An analysis he based on the shape of a dust cloud he saw in a video. That's page 39252 to 39253. When this contradiction was put to him, Popperich simply changed his theory on the spot, asserting that, quote, the angle could be anywhere from two to 80 degrees, end quote. That's page 39261 to 39263. And Popperich's theory has no explanation for the fresh bullet furrows the UN found in its investigation at spot one after the shooting of the pedestrians, which pointed back to the SRK position in House 14. Popperich took none of this into account in his report, instead drawing unfounded conclusions from dust cloud shapes and alleged gestures by unperformed personnel that he saw on a video without having listened to the audio. And I refer to our final brief, Appendix C, Paragraph 11, where we have discussed his theory. The defense theory here is just a slightly refined version of the original conspiracy theory advanced by Mladic to UN officials in response to their protest immediately after this event. Mladic's claim that the fire came instead from the Holiday Inn, pictured here, which was on the opposite side of the tram and therefore completely impossible as a source of fire, was debunked on the spot by the UN, and that's reflected in P867, page two. Having now had 20 odd years to think about it, the defense's executive council building theory is no better. The only reasonable conclusion is that the tram in this incident was fired on from SRK held territory to the south of the Milyachka. And it's worth noting here that the other tram, for other tram attacks in this area, the defense has put forward similarly implausible theories involving fire originating from immediately adjacent buildings. For example, in F8, the defense contends the tram again was fired on from the Executive Council building. That's D4884, paragraphs 123 to 124. For F15, the defense claims the tram was sprayed with machine gun fire from the roof of the Museum of Revolution, which is across the street and to the left of the Holiday Inn, or some un other unspecified, quote, nearby building, end quote. That's page 39281 to 39282 or F-16, where the defense contends that multiple bullets were fired on the tram from the Executive Council building or the museum. That's page 38931. So according to the defense, ABIH members were repeatedly gunning down members of their own population 
right in front of their eyes, as well as the world press and the UN. And as we've pointed out in the discussion of these incidents in our brief, these theories are wholly contradicted by the actual evidence, including, for example, on-site investigation results, forensic analyses, and eyewitness accounts. These repeated untenable defense theories simply underscore the strength of the evidence pointing to SRK responsibility for these attacks. I'd like to move on now to the scheduled shelling incidents. Earlier I discussed the fact that the defense version of the campaign cannot account for the SRK's massive indiscriminate bombardments of the city. For the two such bombardments that are scheduled incidents, G1 and G2, this has played out in the form of unfounded procedural arguments. For G1, the defense unbelievably continues to insist that this incident is not the heavy shelling of Sarajevo from on or about the 28th of May, but a single mortar incident of Vase Miskin Street on the 27th of May, 1992. This claim is directly contradicted by the wording of the indictment and made in the face of repeated notifications by the prosecution and the trial chamber that the Vase Miskin incident is not G1. Not to mention the accused's own express acknowledgement that the Vase Miskin Street incident is not in the indictment. I refer to page 6394 and 28867 of the transcript. The real G1, what Slobodan Milosevic termed a bloody criminal bombardment, consisted of heavy, indiscriminate shelling throughout the city, personally commanded by General Mladic with Karadzic's support. That's in our final brief, we've discussed that at paragraph 727. The defense also relies on Mladic's contemporaneous denial of the authenticity of intercepts, capturing him ordering subordinates to open fire on civilian <coughs> areas of Sarajevo on the 28th and 29th of May. That's D207, relied on at paragraphs 1995 and 1996. Mladic's self-serving claim that these intercepts were fabricated by, quote, pantomime performers, end quote, who could imitate quote, your voice, my voice, and anyone's voice, end quote, made in a conversation which Mladic must have known was being intercept, intercepted is obviously disingenuous. All three intercepts have been reliably authenticated. That's confidential exhibit P1154, pages 69 to 73. For G2, before moving further, I have a question about this G1, but be, before getting to that, could we upload that visual aid again? A, a brief question for the defense. The defense final brief refers to a, an MIS building. Does it mean the red facade building we referred to? I'm asking because we never heard about our MIS building. Your uh, Excellencies, is it F or G? I'm a bit confused that I ha need to consult. This is the F incident, isn't it? Yes, Sh uh, sniping incident, MIS building. You can come back later on. Uh, going back to F-11 incident, Ms. Gustafsson, so is it case that the, on the part of the prosecution it cannot identify the source of fire in this case? That's correct, Your Honor. We cannot identify the precise source of fire because of the conflicting evidence about where the uh, precise location of the attack was, but as as I've explained, this doesn't translate into any failure of proof. And uh, 
the UN report, which is P2421, I remember that somewhere in the report said the UN thought at the time the, the fire, not, not thought, they stated the fire was loud and came from very close. Whether you could address that issue as well. Yes, Your Honor. The, um, I mean, uh, it's unclear exactly what Umberfor meant by very close, but uh, my recollection is that the position they ultimately concluded was a source of fire was somewhere on the order of 600 meters away. So that could easily be considered in this uh, context of this case to be very close. Thank you. Uh, for my question related to G1, shall we move into private session briefly? This brings me to G2. Now, at the very last stage of this five-year trial, the accused is for the first time arguing in his brief that incident G2 is also insufficiently precise for him to effectively respond. This challenge to the indictment is years out of time with no explanation for the failure to raise it previously. And the burden is therefore on the accused to show actual prejudice. And I refer in this regard to the authorities we've cited in our September 11th, 2014 response to a similar series of late indictment challenges. The accused's argument at paragraph 1998 that the indictment fails to make specific reference both temporally and geographically. Uh, just a second. Sorry to interrupt. Has our decision not filed yet on this defect of indictment? We received it um, just maybe at the beginning of this session. Very well. Thank you. Please continue. And the accused's argument at paragraph 1998 that the indictment fails to make specific reference both temporally and geographically is specious because both date from on or about 6 June 1992 and location, a massive bombardment of the city, are specified. In none of the accused's many motions challenging the indictment, including the one just a few weeks ago, has the accused raised this issue, indicating that he has never considered it to be unclear. And in fact, his own brief indicates that he does in fact understand this charge because he has offered a defense. In particular, he claims that combat operations on the 6th of June were directed at repelling ABIH attacks. And that's at paragraph 2001. <coughs> However, even accepting the existence of some combat in the Sarajevo area on 6 June, this cannot account for the wild, scattered artillery attacks across the city, massive nighttime shelling of the city when few, if any, military targets would be visible, and the fact that the shelling mainly hit parts of the city with no apparent military targets and resulted in many civilian casualties. And I refer to the evidence described in our brief at paragraphs 728 and 729. Which brings me to G4. This is the 1st of June, 1993 mortar attack on a crowd of 200 people watching a football match in Dobrynya. The defense in paragraphs 2002 to 2008 relies entirely on Subotic's evidence and claiming that only one shell, not two, was fired in this incident and it was fired from the ABIH side of the confrontation line. Now, Subotic conceded that if a shell had been fired by the ABIH in this instance, it would have been fired from a maximum distance of 200 meters in front of an apartment block in a residential area. This is not even a remotely reasonable alternative. First, it is inconceivable that the ABIH managed to fire two mortar shells on its own people from a distance of no more than 200 meters in a densely populated area on a bright sunny day when a large group of civilians had gathered to watch a football match. 
without detection. Moreover, firing at such a close range and consequently with a very steep firing angle results in the risk, as defense witness Alsa put it, that the shell could fall back down on top of you. That's page 293434, three, sorry. And Hamill explained that the danger radius of an 81 millimeter mortar is 250 meters. Further, the defense claim at paragraph 2007 that the shell could not have been fired from VRS positions. Now this rests on Subotic's demonstrably unreliable analysis. For instance, she claimed, based on her personal examination of a 17-year-old crater, with no embedded stabilizer, of course, that, quote, there is no room for doubt that the angle of descent was greater than 65 degrees, end quote. That's D3542, paragraph 44. Now, this assertion is contradicted by Subotic's own testimony because in another context, she explained that only if the, quote, crater is a good one, end quote, can one, quote, very approximately, end quote, determine angle of descent. That's page 38360. And although a contemporaneous UN report clearly recorded two craters at the scene, that's P1053, page 9. The defense insists this is not the case and relies on Subotic's bizarre claim that two and a half years after this attack, someone inexplicably carved a second crater into the asphalt by hand. That's paragraph 2005, relying on D3542, paragraph 38. In summary, the defense theory rests on an obviously unreliable analysis and entails the highly unlikely prospect that an ABIH mortar crew engaged in a potential suicide mission in order to fire on its own population from an immediately adjacent position without detection. And moving on now to G7. This is the 4th of December, oh, sorry, 4th of February, 1994, attack where three mortar shells landed amongst a group of civilians queuing for humanitarian aid in Debrina. In this case, ballistics experts contemporaneously analyzed the craters, utilizing established methodologies, and determined that the shells originated from SRK territory to the east. The defense argues again based on Subotic's analysis, that this assessment was hugely erroneous, off by roughly 90 degrees, and the shells were instead fired from ABIH territory to the north. And that's at D3542, paragraphs 86 to 87. When Subotic conducted her analysis in 2010, there were no longer remains of any of the craters and only poor quality photos and videos available. Faced with this, she simply discarded all accepted methodologies and engaged in a fantastical tour through the evidence. For example, she assumed from this photo, which is P1710, page 23, reproduced in figure 65 of her report, that the darkened patch of playground seen in the uh, lower left part of the screen in the corner of the playground was in fact a patch of soil. She then further assumed, based on this and similar photos, that this soil must have been thrown onto the playground by a shell impact. To this, she added a string of assumptions, including that the soil had previously been hard packed and therefore that an earlier shell must have impacted nearby in order to loosen this soil to enable it to have been thrown onto the playground by the subsequent shell. She then claimed that she could determine the direction of fire of the shell that supposedly caused these alleged soil traces by examining the orientation of the soil on this photograph. And based on this soil analysis, she concluded that the shell had flown in from ABIH territory 
And therefore, the investigators must have covered up the existence of one of these two shells. That's at D3542, paragraphs 80 to 81. For the shell that landed on the other side of the playground, the investigators at the scene observed that the stabilizer was embedded in an east-west direction. Corroborating the direction of fire, they determined through their crater analysis. That's P1710, page 9. That stabilizer, which is depicted here, and we've circled it for uh, ease of reference, which is figure 78 of D3542. According to the defense, at paragraph 2044, based on Subotich's theory, even though the stabilizer was embedded in an east-west direction, that the shell nevertheless flew in from the north. In Subotich's opinion, quote, the stabilizer had already hit the surface, ricocheted, and found itself in this place, end quote. That's page 38276 of the transcript. In other words, she made the completely impossible claim that this shell flew in from the east, ricocheted, then when it was traveling at a reduced speed as a result of the ricochet, managed to somehow orient itself back towards the ground and firmly embed itself into the asphalt facing east-west. Sorry, she made the completely impossible claim that the shell flew in from the north and then ultimately, after a ricochet, embedded itself in the asphalt facing west. And to top it all off, she claimed that this video still image of another of the stabilizers, this is the one back uh, the other side of the playground, reveals the existence of a Latin letter N in Ariel font on the back of the stabilizer. That's D3542, paragraph 89. When Subotic was shown a comparison of this video still with a far better quality photograph the investigators took of the stabilizer, depicted here in P6324, she agreed that there was no letter N visible in the photograph, but she refused to admit that the photograph on the right here was clearer and she refused to retract her letter N theory, a theory the defense persists in positing at paragraph 2045 of its brief. For this incident, the defense has replaced established scientific methodologies with a cover-up theory, a magically propelled stabilizer, and an image conjured out of thin air. Moving on to G8, this is the 5th of February, 1994, Markale massacre. Local and UN investigators determined that the shell was fired on a bearing of around 18 plus or minus 5 degrees. And Zetchevich's team of ballistics experts measured a 60 plus or minus 5 degree angle of descent. Based on the depth of the embedded stabilizer, Zetchevich excluded the possibility of one to three charges and therefore concluded that the firing range was between 4,500 and 6,500 meters, well beyond the confrontation line 2,600 meters away. And this conclusion is corroborated by other evidence we've set out at paragraph 59 of Appendix C of our brief. The defense brings two main challenges to these findings. First, according to the defense, the distance to the firing location could not be established because the disturbed crater did not allow for a precise angle of descent measurement. And second, the defense contends that one cannot determine where the mortar was fired from by the fact of the embedded stabilizer. That's paragraph 2096 of its brief. In an effort to undermine Zetchevich's angle of descent calculation, 
the defense relies on Alsop's evidence that the angle of the embedded stabilizer was not necessarily the angle of the trajectory at the time of impact. The defense ignores, however, that Alsop ultimately confirmed the reliability of Zetchevich's angle of descent calculation. At page 29508 of the transcript, after Alsop agreed that the angle of descent must have fallen within a 35 degree range between 50 and 85 degrees, he was asked, now Dr. Zetchevich, in the evidence which he provided to the chamber has included a margin of error of 10 degrees out of a possible range that you've identified of 35 degrees. So he's approaching a margin of error, error of around I'm trying to do the calculation. It's certainly around 33%. Do you accept that? Answer, yes. Now, that is a fairly generous margin of error. Can we agree on that? Answer, yes. Now, even if one were to accept any of the issues which you've raised in your report, I put it to you that the possible impact on the trajectory of the projectile caused by any of those issues during those 50 centimeters that it traveled at high speed before being lodged into the ground was more than adequately taken into account by a margin of error of over 33%. Answer, yes. The defense's own expert, having confirmed the reliability of Zetchevich's 55 to 65 degree angle of descent calculation, the defense is left to contest Zetchevich's velocity calculation based on the depth of the embedded stabilizer. And again, the defense relies on Alsop's report while ignoring that Alsop agreed that several of his theoretical objections may not apply in this case. And we've set those out at Appendix C, Paragraph 60. But in any event, defense expert Subotich opined that the fact of an embedded stabilizer means the shell must have been fired with at least three charges. That's transcript page 38456. And Zetchevich also explained that with charge three, a stabilizer may or may not become embedded but if the stabilizer is embedded, this implies a minimum of three charges. That's transcript page 12174 to 12175. So if we take the evidence at its most favorable for the defense, based on the admissions of its own expert witnesses, and therefore assuming a possible launch with three rather than four charges, and the maximum angle of descent of 65 degrees, which of course translates into the closest possible firing distance, the corresponding distance would be approximately 3,600 meters. That's P2317, page six. Still well within SRK territory. In its brief at paragraphs 2091 to 2092, the defense basks in the prosecution's failure to point to any lack of neutrality or impartiality on Alsop's part. The defense has entirely missed the point. Alsop confirmed Zetchevich's key conclusion on angle of descent. The only other defense option here is a conspiracy theory involving a mortar shell placed at a predetermined angle on a stand in a busy marketplace, a static explosion, a staged incident scene with planted corpses, and a stabilizer manually embedded in the tarmac with a spade. We've addressed this theory at paragraph 45 of Appendix C of our brief. Moving on now to G9, the 22nd of December, 1994 attack where two 76 millimeter artillery shells hit a flea market in Basharshia. And again, the defense's primary theory, set out at paragraphs 2119 to 2121, is that this attack 
was entirely staged. This theory would require the court to accept that Bosnian authorities managed to place an artillery shell and a pile of TNT in a busy marketplace and detonate them both remotely without detection. Then, during the two hours and 40 minutes when the investigators were on scene, and that's D554, page two, they managed to stage an elaborate cover-up which included manually excavating a crater in the asphalt. That's paragraph 2120. And this was supposedly all done in front of seven UN officials who were present during the investigation. That's D554, page 2, and P1276, paragraph 40, 47, who apparently did not notice. The defense has also made a contradictory claim for this incident, that it has not been established that the source of fire was the Bosnian Serb side rather than the Bosnian Muslim side of the confrontation line. That's paragraph 2122. And they rely here on conclusions in other cases. The evidence in this case shows that these shells were fired from a B1 76 millimeter gun from the Trebovich Vidikovac area in SRK territory. This was the conclusion reached by investigators at the time based not only on their ballistics analysis, but on the fact that several people heard the shells being fired from the Vidikovac Trebovich area. And that's in D554. Moreover, the VRS held firing positions in Vidikovac throughout the war. That evidence, that evidence is in Appendix C, paragraph 61 of our brief. The SRK was in possession of at least 14 76 millimeter B1 guns in the Sarajevo area, that's in P5056, including one in the Hresha Vidikovac area and several at nearby Lukavica, that's P1021. Meanwhile, D779, a March 1995 SRK order, indicates that the ABIH First Corps the entire Corps had only one B1 76 millimeter gun located in the area of Biela Lieska. And this SRK map, P1021, identifies that gun's location. On the left is the zoomed in portion of the map, on the right is the map entirely. And you see the letter. T-76, T of course stands for top <coughs> or gun in BCS. So this is clearly a reference to a 76 millimeter gun. And on the right hand side image, it's clear this gun was far to the southwest of Sarajevo and outside the encircled city, inaccessible to ABIH forces inside Sarajevo. And this is further corroborated by P5968, a January 1994 SRK attack order identifying known ABIH artillery pieces in Sarajevo that does not list a single B1 76 millimeter gun. There isn't a shred of credible evidence pointing to ABIH responsibility in this case. All the evidence relevant to the attack in addition to the evidence of a consistent pattern of similar SRK attacks, points to SRK responsibility. Which brings me to G19, the 28th of August, 1995, Markley Massacre. Now for this attack, contrary to defense contentions, the evidence clearly excludes the possibility that the shell was fired from the ABIH side of the confrontation line. On Mose at a nearby observation point, OP1, neither saw nor heard any firing activity within ABIH territory. And if it had been fired from the Bosnian lines, it certainly would have been heard by OP1. That's Konings, P1953, paragraphs 23, 90, and 91. 
For Konings, Smith, Turkesic, and Higgs, OP1's observations implied that the origin of fire was SRK territory. I refer to paragraph 65 of Appendix C of our brief. The defense's own expert, Subotic, agreed that the fact that the UMMOs did not hear or record the outgoing mortar shell, quote, ruled out, end quote, the possibility that the shell was fired from ABIH territory. That D3551, paragraphs 111 and 114 sub E. Moreover, while the defense at paragraph 2148 relies on Demarenko's claim to have personally explored, quote, thousands of square meters across the entire slope, end quote, of Mount Trebovich and found no possible SRK mortar position, even Demarenko did not think this was a plausible claim. And I refer to his evidence at page 28928. The alternative defense theory is another staged static explosion based on another set of Subotic's typically unfounded conclusions. For example, the defense claim at paragraphs 2140 to 2141 that in fact multiple stabilizers were recovered from the scene rests largely on Subotic's comparison of image, images showing different orientations of the stabilizer's primer from which she concluded that these were extremely similar, but in fact different stabilizers. That's D3551, paragraph 103. And this visual, uh, figure 108 of her report, shows her comparison of these primer orientations. However, when Subotic was actually handed the stabilizer in court, she agreed that she could actually freely move the primer with her own fingers. That's transcript page 38574 and 38579. Did she then concede that her theory of multiple and nearly identical stabilizers were recovered from the scene was unfounded? No. On the spot, she created yet another conspiracy theory to cover up her first conspiracy theory, insisting that it was quote unquote certain that after the fact, quote, somebody deliberately screwed and unscrewed the ring, end quote. That's page 38592 to 38593. And in paragraph 2127, the defense also adopts Subotic's conclusion, falling far outside even her alleged expertise, that there is insufficient blood beneath the body of this victim depicted here to match the size of his wound. That's D3551, figure 89. Although neither the defense in its brief nor Subotic in her report explained the theory behind such claims, Karadzic himself, in his cross-examination of Mr. Turkesic on these images, explained his position. Karajic contended that most of these bodies were old corpses dumped at the scene, quote, just set there to frame this explosion. That's page 9093 to 9096. <coughs> so the defense is clearly contending that in the aftermath of this explosion, Bosnian authorities managed to transplant dozens of previously collected and stored dead bodies with wounds roughly consistent with mortar explosion injuries to the scene of this explosion and plant them in the midst of the existing carnage in front of dozens of witnesses without detection. As Mr. Turkesic said when this theory was put to him by Karadzic, this kind of quote unquote speculation, quote, is the only thing that could possibly be more monstrous than this scene itself, end quote. That's page 9096. Moving on now to the modified air bombs incidents. 
As we described in our brief, during the latter stages of the campaign, the SRK began launching modified air bombs into the city. These highly inaccurate, highly destructive weapons were employed to terrorize the civilian population. I refer to paragraphs 772 to 776 of our brief. The defense claim at paragraph 2389 that the prosecution failed to cross-examine Subotic on the scheduled air bomb incidents and instead engaged in, quote, futile theoretical discussions, end quote, misses the point entirely. The prosecution put to Subotic that for each of the scheduled incidents, her, quote, most probable target, end quote, analysis consisted of seeing where the target landed uh, sorry, seeing where the projectile landed and then identifying a nearby supposed military object. Subotic confirmed this. She explained that she had not been provided with any VRS documents supporting her most probable target analysis, an analysis which, quote, had nothing to do with the military doctrine or anything like that, end quote. She had identified these alleged targets because, quote, all of them were either on the incoming trajectory or close to the incoming trajectory of the projectile, end quote. That's page 38533 to 38535. This questioning revealed that there was no independent factual basis for Subotic's most probable targets. It also exposed her analysis of the accuracy of air bombs as circular because she based that analysis largely on the distance between the impact point and her alleged most probable target. That's D3540, paragraph 151. In other words, Subotic identified the closest po possible object to the air bomb impact that she could reasonably contend had any kind of military use. Then she asserted that this was, in fact, the intended target of the air bomb. And then she concluded that air bombs were precise because they landed so close to these objects, objects she had identified in the first place because they were so close to the impact. In its brief, the defense clings to this circular methodology, for example, at paragraph 2382, while failing to explain how two imprecise weapons, unguided rockets and air bombs, were allegedly made far more precise when fused together in an improvised manner. And the defense is not engaged at all with the multiple reasons modified air bombs were even less accurate than the underlying weapons, reasons we have set out in our brief at paragraph 708. And the defense ignores admissions to that effect from its own witnesses, such as Valjevich, who admitted that modified air bombs could be off target by huge margins and were therefore impermissible for use in urban areas. Quote, because there was a risk that we might actually hit our own men or civilians, end quote. That's page 29269 to 29270. Or Demarenko, who said in an interview that modified air bombs were a weapon strapped together and launched, quote, wherever God may send it, end quote. P5925, P page 3. And the defense ignores contemporaneous confirmation of their inaccuracy by the SRK reflected by P1310, an SRK report explaining that a modified air bomb launch had been aborted due to the risk of hitting SRK troops who were half a kilometer away from the target. Defense arguments about testing or checking the underlying components of modified air bombs, for example, at paragraphs 2349, 2354 and 2385 are irrelevant. The issue is that modified air bombs were an improvised and untested combination of already imprecise components. 
And the defense assertion that modified air bombs themselves were actually testified, uh, sorry, actually tested, paragraph 2350, is based largely on the vague, self-serving testimony of Dragomir Milosevic, who in any event offered no indication as to the nature of any alleged testing. That's 32771 to 32773. And even if such evidence is taken at face value, it does not even approach the seven to eight years of testing that defense witness Angelkovich Lukic confirmed would be required for a new weapons system. That's 31494. The defense claim at paragraph 2357 to 2358 that the ABIH used modified air bombs is based on vague, unsubstantiated claims by self-interested SRK officers, which is not even remotely linked to any scheduled or unscheduled modified air bomb incidents. The defense has ignored the extensive prosecution evidence that the ABIH did not have or use modified air bombs in Sarajevo, at paragraph 705 in our brief. And the defense has explicitly acknowledged that the SRK fired the air bombs for G10, G11, and G12 in its brief. The defense claims that in using modified air bombs, quote, it was not the intention of the SRK units nor the core command to terrorize civilians paragraph 2356, is a deflection. The indictment principally alleges that Karadzic and other pleaded JCE me members had the specific intent to spread terror, not the entire SRK. But regardless, the only possible purpose of deploying modified air bombs in Sarajevo was to terrorize the civilian population as reflected by Umpafor's contemporaneous assessment that these were, quote, highly inaccurate, indiscriminate, highly destructive weapons of terror, end quote. That's P896. Absent any questions, Your Honors, that concludes my submissions. Thank you. We'll have a break for an hour and resume at 1.40. All rise. Peu vous levez.